This is EntreEd Talk, the podcast for entrepreneurial educators by entrepreneurial educators. We are your hosts, Toy Hirschman and Amber Ravenscroft. This podcast is created by the National Consortium for Entrepreneurship Education, or EntreEd for short. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of EntreEd Talk. We are so delighted to have our friend Dan Jackson with us today. Dan is a lifelong reflective learner and strategic thinker with an ongoing track record of innovative, adaptive leadership in education and business management. Dan is skilled in student development, educational leadership, and instructional design. This is Dan's 15th year as a business marketing educator, his fifth in North Carolina. Dan also helps mentor MBA teams as an executive in residence for the Technology Entrepreneurship and Commercialization Program. A lot of words in that program, a unique interdiscipl interdisciplinary program that provides students the knowledge, skills, and tools needed to bring technology innovations to market. Dan has founded Applied Synergies Partnership, ASAP, a community-based student-centered experiential entrepreneurship education program for high school students. Welcome, Dan. We're so excited to have you today. Well, thank you, Toy, and thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, having an impact, I hope, on some young people. Absolutely. So we always like to get started um, by asking our awesome guests uh, before we begin, jump into some of our, our questions, if you could give us a little bit of background about, you know, how you got to where you are today and <laughs> your, your journey, if you will. I, I certainly will. My journey has been somewhat of a circuitous one. And I like to think of my life, if you will, as more of a spaghetti bowl that has been cooked as opposed to uncooked spaghetti, and that it hasn't been a straight path. I have a piece that I've written out on my blog that goes into a little bit more detail, but I went to nine schools in seven years and never really found a mentor, never really found a teacher that was impacting me. My parents were divorced and separated and across the country, and it just, I went back and forth. I was actually talking about this with my wife the other day and talking about how I got into teaching, and she said to me, Dan, you mentioned at our senior prom in high school the fact that you wanted to be a teacher. And I was like, wow, I remember that now, but I'd completely forgotten it. Uh, I had, uh, there was some, some allure to the business world and the corporate world, and I liked business, and I liked sales, and I loved marketing and everything. And so we said, let's put together a plan that uh, maybe 15 years in the corporate world and then go into teaching. Uh, and the towers came down just, what, 18 years ago on Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. And it was at that point she and I kind of reevaluated and said, you know what, we're a few years before we planned on doing it, but we've had a good run in the corporate world. Let's go have some positive impact on young people. And so I moved into teaching, got my secondary certification from Wayne State University, fantastic program there. Moved to Indiana and began student teaching at Carmel High School there, and that was 16 years ago. Dan, you and I have a lot in common. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure all good things, right, Toy? I decided to teach on 9 11 also. I was in the corporate world, and that happened, and yeah, that's kind of wild. And uh, and I have a similar story that a trajectory after that. So we'll 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 share that together sometime. Cool. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that I mean, so I love to talk about like the corporate world that you were in and stuff. But I'm also really interested in that you've been in 15 years of business marketing education specifically. Did you teach any other subjects during that span? Or did you go straight into that subject area? I went straight into that subject area. And that was on purpose. And the experience that I gained in the corporate world was also meant to fine tune my ability to deliver meaningful and relevant education to these young people and not have it be driven by a textbook, but have it be driven more by experiences. And from the day one that I stepped into a classroom, it was project based oriented. Let's get our hands dirty. Let's get messy. And I, I have taught my favorite classes to teach are indeed entrepreneurship, personal finance, and marketing. I've also done international business. I did some computer stuff that really bored the tears out of me. Uh, and I just, <laughs> it really did because it's, then it's just like turn to page 33 and finish that exercise and you get a word certification. Right. 
you know, big deal. I, that's not educating. That's not instructing. That's, I mean, you can do that online. I would be curious, like, how have you seen that in that area of education? Have you seen it change? Do you think it needs to over your span of your career? I know we're asking the provocative questions here. Oh, the, the, hey, the deeper you get, the better. In terms of the, the <laughs> evolution of education is something that I'm pretty big on, especially how it has evolved in the last, since I've been in education. You know, I've seen No Child Left Behind come through. I've seen Race to the Top. I've seen all of these programs that essentially have schooled out of our young people curiosity, creativity, imagination, and we've schooled them on how to pass standardized tests. And this this is nothing new to people who are listening to this. If you're interested in education, you know how this has evolved. And my big push right now, with my nonprofit as well, is try to turn education into more experiences and events rather than textbooks, study guides, and tests. The Business and marketing in particular shouldn't be evaluated by an end of course assessment. It should be, a, and if you do an end of course assessment, it should be performance and how competent are you in delivering the skills and abilities needed to perform in the workforce. You know, I said it in my TED talk 25 years as a professional, and the only time I've ever been asked to take a test is to become an educator. That's our sound bite for the podcast. <laughs> Yeah. And, and uh, you're, you've been in it about the same length of time as I have. And it's, and it's interesting to me how like the business and marketing, I mean, I, you know, we're entrepreneurship education, so we know, <laughs> but the business and marketing to me, that kind of, that whole area should have really is really a hotbed of experiential learning. I mean, that's all mm-hmm. it's about. And, um, but back, back 15 years ago or so, you know, project lead the way was really the only national as far as I know, real, you know, solid hands-on experiential mm-hmm. type of thing. And that was generally, it, kids generally got thrown in there based on, oh, I want to be an engineer. You didn't really get a mm-hmm. chance to just try it out, which I wish everybody would have. I'm a big fan um, of that program, but it's, it just seems it's strange to me that we are taking so long to get to where we need to be. Well, I, I, let me comment on that. Be interesting that you bring up PLTW because I used to pass them every day on the way to work when I lived in Carmel, Indiana, and I was teaching in Lawrence Township. And as you know, PLTW is headquartered there in Indianapolis. And we had three PLTW programs at the school that I taught at. Uh, Indiana, I do not believe, was a common core state. And so they weren't tied to the testing and all of the regulations and accountability measures that so many states are. And the from the get-go, like I said, as soon as I walked into an Indiana classroom, it was project-based learning. And business and marketing is definitely geared to that. Really, other than the acumen, the vocabulary, everything else should be hands-on. I would, yeah. like, I would have liked to see a, an entrepreneurship component put into PLTW. <laughs> um, I'm very, very good friends. My One of my mentors is the guy who started Project Lead the Way, Dick Blaze. Mm-hmm. And, I, and our executive director, Gene, and, and Dick and I are, are buddies from a long, 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 long time ago. And so it's it's a great program. Um, he gave it up years ago, though. So mm-hmm. it's now co- more corporate-based, I guess, kind of. Well, it actually brings up an interesting question, too, gals, in that One of my big pushes also is for kids to discover what it is that they're interested in a little earlier on. And so if you can get them in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade before they start getting into this mindset of AP, IB tests, and you allow them to go through career discovery and self-exploration, interests, abilities, attitudes, aptitudes, passions, purpose, and then you take that in sixth or seventh grade and you have this collection of information, and this young person does, then they're shown a high school planning guide. And there's a, hey, you know what? You expressed an interest, say, in health sciences. Look at all the health science classes that are offered at this high school you'll be attending. Look at all these business classes. I have grown really sick and tired of hearing young people as ninth graders say, I never knew that that existed. <laughs> why don't they know? Why, why aren't counselors and deans from middle schools and high schools communicating with one another, tapping into these interests, tapping into these passions, and allowing kids to build a profile of passion 
over their high school career rather than just build a transcript. Right. And why can't we take those classes as a, a la carte? Like, why do, why do they have to complete some pathway? You know, um, why can't I take auto shop and also home ec and also uh-huh. business and also nursing? And I mean, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, Dan. So maybe if I'd had those opportunities, <laughs> I might know. Well, what I would strongly encourage both of you to do is what I do, and that's not grow up. Well, yeah, I'm working. I'm working really hard on that. <laughs> I'm doing a great job so far. <laughs> I'm also in my parents' bedroom. No. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So I'm forty. If, 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 one. <laughs> next topic. So if you if you're talking about pathways and things like that. Um, there are a la carte opportunities, and it's kind of what I call the buffet table. Uh, mm-hmm. I, at least here in North Carolina and in Indiana, where I was, if you started a pathway, you didn't necessarily have to complete it. You could kind of dabble in some things, which I think is important also. But imagine if you dabbled in your career exploration class in seventh grade. And then in eighth yeah. grade, you were able to take your Microsoft certification so that you know how to type and work Excel and build a PowerPoint that actually looks decent. And then when you get into high school, you take those skills and you begin to apply them to, I don't know, it could be engineering, it could be business, it could be health sciences. You know, and then also you, you were mentioning the idea of why isn't entrepreneurship in these other programs? The entrepreneurship program that I ran back in Indiana was generally full of kids that came from computer programming, that came from B- PLTW, advanced manufacturing and robotics and biomedical science. And the plans that they would end up writing were based upon things that they were doing in those classes. That's awesome. Yeah, so in yeah, a that's disc, really cool. in a disc in one way, but still CTE components. Yeah, if a robot yeah. falls in the forest and no one's around to market it. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> I really <laughs> nobody I really never think... lands. But like we I would, if we have the kids even in Project Lead the Way and, and even really good engineering or design programs, uh-huh. it like ends with the artifact or the prototype and you never talk about what's next. You know? It drives me crazy. Yeah, for those kids because I have I have two sections of entrepreneurship one that have a cap of twenty five in each section. So a total of 50 spaces, and I end up generally with about 160 to 170 requests each year to get into it. Wow. And a lot of those kids are coming from uh, engineering, health sciences, et cetera. I just learned today at lunch, I was sitting down at a table with some kids and eating lunch, and I said, well, what are you doing in my entrepreneurship class? And they said, I don't know. I just got placed there. I really have no idea. (laughs) And it really broke my heart because I'm thinking, not for her, but for those kids who are trying to get into the class that she's taking a space of that hasn't got the real passion for it. Yeah, no, I under, I could really, so I think that everything we've talked about here would have been super beneficial for me going through my trajectory in life, just because I, like Toy said, it took me a long time to even figure out that I, what entrepreneurship was. Toy and I are both living in a very rural area of Maryland where it's not a lot of, um, we have like very poor curriculum and then very few electives that are really engaging. And so as a student, I just went through and took the AP courses that were recommended to me. No passions were explored. I went into college because I thought I was going to go into a lawyer because my family told me that. And so I'm really interested how, if I would have at a very young age been given the opportunity to explore my strengths and like what I was interested about, like where I would have been right now. And I want to talk about how you've taken that because I think it's really important at the college level because you mentor those MBA teams mm-hmm. in the tech entrepreneurship and commercialization program. Can you tell us what, what that what that's like? Because a lot of times when people think about MBAs, they think of a very traditional business program. And so I'm interested in your kind of take on that and how you mentor those students. Okay. Well, I got, actually, there was probably about three questions in there. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack. I'm sorry. That's normally how my questions are. That's okay. Let's, (laughs) let's let's go. Just so remember that the NC state program, we can refer to it as tech so that we don't have to say all those syllables. Okay. Okay. And so, but before we get to tech, you remind me of tech if I don't get to it. But one thing that you said, Amber, that really kind of sticks in my craw 
is that my parents made me do this or my parents said to do that. Why are you taking three APs? Well, my parent, my mother said I need it for my transcript. And we talk about parents who wish to have their kids be happy, yet they push their kids into doing something that really the parent wants them to do. And how many kids mm-hmm. do we know of that get to college because that's what they're supposed to do, and then they drop out within a year or two because it's just not for them? What I really like for parents to hear is if you really want your kids happy, allow them to go through career exploration in seventh, eighth, ninth grade and allow them to choose the path that they're going to take. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I think um, it's important for the school because when I went through the process, right, I was the first, I'm the youngest, I mean, I'm the oldest student in my family. So Mm -hmm. for me, the pathway that the school promoted was college. And to get there, they promoted AP to get me higher. So it was like the school had told my family almost they pushed college so hard that my parents were like, oh, she needs to be in AP classes to get credit. So it was kind of like the message that the school was giving, especially the first gen. I, I'm the first one that's gone four years of college uh, and the first oldest child in the family. So, it's yeah, it's interesting how that was portrayed in terms of where my path needed to be in life mm-hmm. um, and what I ended up doing because of my parents. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about it that way. Well, I have a four-year engineering degree because of my parents and my grandparents. You say that rather begrudgingly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's that degree has never failed me, and I'm very happy, and I was proud to get it, but it wasn't my passion. I never mm-hmm. picked up a wrench in my life, and then all of a sudden I was in mechanical engineering, taking apart, you know, HVAC systems, which was kind of cool. But yeah. it, it was not something that I that I had, you know, I tinkered with. My mm-hmm. <laughs> so same same thing. And I mean, and I didn't grow up. I grew up in New Jersey. So it was I mean, that was just what you did. Like and I guess yeah. maybe I, I never questioned it. Until well, you talk you talk about picking up a wrench. And so we could also turn to the idea that that HVAC companies that are run by folks who have certifications in plumbing, heating, et cetera, and don't have four or five, six, eight years of post-secondary education are doing extremely well for themselves. And they're doing, yep. in, in many cases, much better than the guy who has a master's in engineering, you know, who's working for a company. And I think that's something else that's missing in education right now is that this big push to college is then limiting the options that we make available to our young people. And if they knew mm-hmm. what it was that they wanted to do after high school, before they made a decision to go to college, they may take a completely different route and go to a vocational school, a technical school. And in two years time, they're running their own business. So oh, I can't you, you I would have went a different route. <laughs> te- technicians uh, know and always did know a lot more than I did in the engineering world. And like, I'm, I'm barely able to change brakes on my kid's four wheeler. I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing but, you know eighty thousand dollars later and i can uh, take apart a rear brake <laughs> that, you are a wild woman you're out there working on brakes and stuff wow thanks mom and dad for that welcome to toy <laughs> well you you had mentioned the the tech program at nc state university and you want to get back to that yeah yeah okay. i'm interested to hear how this has happened like your the movement into the college student realm? Well, I had, uh, I'll try to make a short story of it. I was introduced to a gentleman that is the current assistant director of the Keenan Institute for Engineering Technology and Science at North Carolina State. And he and I sat down for it sometime in October of 2015. And I left there with the question of how do we integrate high quality career and technical education the institutions of higher learning in our state and the vibrant startup community that we have in the RDU area. And I kind of went to my thoughtful spot and sat there and kind of thought for a while. And all of a sudden it occurred to me that I did a lot of things already that were project-based and the like, but they, he was a mentor in this tech program. So he actually called me up while almost while I was thinking of this, excuse me. And he said, would you like to be an executive in residence or an educator in residence and mentor these teams? I said, yeah, actually I would. I I kind of, you know, 
I miss college. I miss sex. It's cool. And so I went in and suddenly it was like, why can't I do this in a high school classroom? And so really, again, a kind of a two pronged question. Mentoring the NBA teams is cool because this is a really neat program. Kids, or I shouldn't say kids, many of them are, you know, grown adults, you know, 30, 40 years old, but they're, they're coming from masters in biology and chemical sciences and stuff, engineering and things that I can't even talk about and the MBA program. So you have PhD candidates, okay. master candidates, business, all working together on technology that is developed at either Virginia Commonwealth, East Carolina or North Carolina State. And it's really cool. a lot of the, what they're talking about in these team meetings. I have no idea about biosynthesis or anything like that. But the skills, whether you're an MBA student or whether you're a high school student or whether you're just a regular constant learner, you need the skills like analysis, research, getting voice a customer. Uh, how do you network? How do you communicate? How do you make presentations? How do you write well? And so I kind of focus in on those things. And kind of as a, as a funny story is that, well, it's not a funny story. We have presentations that are regularly given in my class for their business plans, and they probably make five presentations. I have then invited students to come to the tech class and make their presentations to the MBAs and everybody that are sitting there they set the standard for these. Even people who have been professionals for 8, 10, 12 years still don't know how to present, still don't know how to make a PowerPoint, still don't know how to influence an audience. And it's cool. That's very neat. Yeah, I, I love that. And so did, is that kind of, okay, I'm going to take a step back, but I'm going to infer that maybe that experience kind of helped with the nonprofit that you founded and like the mission of the nonprofit maybe? The, I'm ready to dive into the nonprofit. Okay, the nonprofit. <laughs> well, let, let me see. The, the nonprofit was something. So, the gentleman who is the assistant director at Keats, Raj Narayan, and I, um, I've act, he has acted as my mentor since I got here in North Carolina and I met him. And he and I have always just said, we've got something here. We, something needs to be done with what it is we're doing in high schools. The positive impact that we're having in young people's, on families, on, and, so when we always like, are we going to write a book? Are we going to, what are we going to do? And finally, I just said, you know what? Let's just take the first step and let's turn ourselves into a nonprofit because of the fact, I don't want ever anybody questioning my motives. And my motive is to have a positive impact on young people, intentionally develop what it is that they need as soon as possible. So we have a double entendre there with the ASAP. And um, the nonprofit's I see mission. See what you did there. Now I get it. Now I get it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's clever. Well, th I, thank you. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. and it's so you actually have. If you look at my Twitter handle, which is mind on asap with underscores in between the, the the words. It's not only meaning get your mind on as soon as possible, but right now my mind is on how do we develop applied synergies partnership to have a greater impact on more kids. Uh, my mission, my vision has always been for all learners of all ages to wake up every day and to look forward to going to school. And I believe experiential entrepreneurship education is a major tool in having that happen. I know it because the kids tell it to me. Uh, our purposes are really to spread experiential entrepreneurship education to educators so that they in turn can turn their classrooms more into learning labs than they are content driven curriculum driven spaces and we uh, we found we were founded in march i have a full board of of seven people they're community professionals there's university folks we have officers that are out there doing work on research community involvement grant writing and with the whole purpose being getting to educators so that they can get to their students. So is that what is, is give me like the, the day in the life. If I'm, I'm a teacher and I stumble upon your organization, what, what would happen next? Would, you know, would I have, would you give me resource? What, how, how what do you do? Like, how do you? Right. Well, the, 
That's exactly the question that Board and I were talking about <laughs> just a few months. Because we started to sit down and we're like, well, let's apply for some grants. And we're like, well, what do we have to apply for? What are we doing? You know, what, what's the product or whatever? And so the where we are leaning right now, and I'm working, well, let me see if I can consolidate this. We would like to be able to go to schools and or districts, work with business, marketing, entrepreneurship educators to show them how to bring their classroom to life. And right now I'm working with three other educators in the state of North Carolina, and I am giving to them what I'm doing in class, and they're following along behind me. And we're about to have our first or second face-to-face -face meeting on the 21st, Saturday, next weekend, to discuss how did those first few weeks go. And so what they're telling me then, I can refine and then put into what might become a book, what might become a train the trainer module, which, so we're a little vague on it right now. Um, I think where I am leaning is to develop or to write a grant so that we can pay somebody to help write a book with these lessons in it, with the impact that they have, with the student voice that comes from the reflective learning afterwards. And so somebody might then have something that they can look at and go, I want, I can do this. I have a step-by-step -step plan. Here are all the lessons. We would sell the book, we would sell the training, and the money would just be poured back into the nonprofit so that we could reach more educators. I love that. You're operating as a true nonprofit startup. <laughs> Lots of experiments and testing. <laughs> uh, we, are de we are in an iterative process. And it's um, also my, my students are fantastic. My students, they, they want to be on podcasts. They want to write blogs on my behalf. They want to get the word out of what impact ASAP had on them. Um, my entrepreneurship two class right now, I said, okay, guys, this is what I'm doing. I need your help. I've been delivering to them the lessons before I deliver it to E1 and before I give it to the educators that are out there so that my E2, all of my seniors can say, well, you might try this. You might change this. We didn't like this. And so I have like this curriculum advisory council of 15 seniors, which are kind of cool. Yeah, that's, that's super cool. That's awesome. We had a, a guest on not too long ago that that we were just really impressed because they do the same thing. They ask the students like that's that's such a great thing to do. But so many teachers, educators don't do that. Like ask the students. <laughs> ask well, them, they, help check them, it out. Have I mean, them help you refine your product. Yeah. You know? Well, and I'm not and I don't want to say all educators. I'll try to remain from being absolute, but there are a lot of educators out there who think of their pupils as being their subjects, you, you know, and they're the sage on the stage. And I think of it like this, is that our students are our customers, mm -hmm. and we need to deliver to our customers what they want. Also, they are our products, in that we have to develop these products so that they can be utilized effectively in the next stage of their life when they go out to the career force. So it's customer and product. So we also, we talk with industry. I have 15 industry professionals that act as innovation coaches that come in and mentor these young kids. Some of these people are sitting on my board for ASAP. Some of them are officers. I sit down with them and say, what does industry need? What can we help with here? What, what can we do differently? And the industry folks are like, this is blowing me away that this is actually being done in the classroom. Why hasn't this been done more? And then that's another trigger that goes off in my heart and mind that says, why isn't it being done more? Okay, let's make it happen. And so then that was another found was another inspiration for me to found ASAP and get it rolling. I love that. I can't wait to see what, what grows from this. I didn't realize it me had too. been founded. So, so <laughs> I, I had, didn't realize that it was so new. So I'm really excited to, to kind of see where it, ha where it grows and just follow along with your story. Cause I think it'll be really impactful. I so. appreciate, I appreciate you saying that. And a number of people have said document, you know, get out there and just create a blog that documents your step-by-step -step or whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, you want me to do this? You want me to do that? You want me to, I mean, I'm only <laughs> one guy with 24 hours in a day and I got a family. So, um, 
and and you're right it's young but we've been doing it for three years and this, we're mm-hmm. now in our fourth year and so we've got it down to a pretty good science through an iterative process through talking with students through talking with coaches what can we do better and the i believe a year from now or sooner there should be something tangible that other educators can use i think that's great and I like the um, the idea of it being so educator focused because I feel like a lot of entrepreneurship programs are student focused. So I think it's crucial that we reach that educator audience. And this was kind of, it kind of ties into one of our questions actually is like how would you sell it? Like how do you sell the importance of entrepreneurship education if you're talking to somebody in the K twelve arena? Like why is it important for them to do this? Oftentimes, we, when we think of entrepreneurs, we can think of it as the guy running a gas station or his own HVAC company, or he's a plumber. Sometimes we may think of the big boys like Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And that's not always the case. You don't necessarily have to start a multi-billion dollar business. You don't necessarily have to run a, you know, a chicken shack to be an, to be an entrepreneurial thinker. So what we do with these young people is not necessarily develop entrepreneurs. We develop people who can think entrepreneurially. And so they're thinking through the, they're thinking through the algorithm. They're thinking through the process. They have design thinking abilities and experience that they can take out to the workforce. That workforce might be a job that they're hired at a fortune 500 company or a mom and pop shop down the street. Entrepreneurship education is not for somebody who just wants to open up their own business. Entrepreneurship education is for anybody who wants to have a positive impact in the next stage of their life. Joy smiling. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You see the steam coming up. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's our heart too, where we just, we just really want to create, environments where teachers can where teachers can be empowered and when they understand the importance it's easy it's easy to get it to the kids once they once they get it but and and it's hard sometimes when we meet with with groups of teachers that they don't identify as entrepreneurially minded themselves a lot of times so I'm curious like have you had those kind of conversations with with schools and districts and you're you're mainly targeting the business marketing teachers that are kind of, if they're not in it, they're on the fringe of that world already. But have you ever, you know, talked to math teachers and English teachers and tried to explain, you know, why is this important even in those subject areas? Well, that's not an open-ended question. I can just answer it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then how, Sorry, like, it. <laughs> how do you say um, you know, When you bring to market a disruptive approach to something, not everybody is going to warm up to you. And a lot of teachers are interested in doing the same thing because it comes easy and they really don't have to do anything more in order to get the test scores. I'm not in it for test scores. I'm in it for the young learner who's going to have to go out into the life after high school. I have spoken with other teachers and some are very receptive of it. Most of those who are receptive of it are outside of my building. Interesting. So there's some contextual things we're <laughs> up yeah. on there. Well, there's, and, and you yes, know, there's, there's a cauldron to be stirred, but we're not going to stir it. I like my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the more the more that we that we dive into to schools and school reform in this in this area, um, you know, I've heard this more times. It makes me feel very nauseous every time I hear it. But I've heard this very matter of fact. What get what gets tested gets done. So, um, and and when you're trying to, you know, it's it's like the starfish thing. Okay, I you know I save that starfish. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like one at a time. And, and when we look at reform on a bigger scale, we really have to figure out how to get into those tested areas, the, the, you know, because that's, that's where things will start to change. But I know that's the million dollar question, right? 
Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm trying to find some, a comment from a teacher that was out there. So we'll just put this on pause for a second. What was really cool was that I had a opportunity to help revise the marketing curriculum for the state of North Carolina. And I hadn't taught marketing in three years when they invited me to do it. And they had experienced my themselves at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, my students and the impact that my program had had on them. And so they asked me to revise it. Then they invited me to become part of a statewide entrepreneurship think tank that has universities, nonprofit organizations, et cetera, to help develop the new curriculum for entrepreneurship. When I was at state conference in Greensboro and I was unveiling this new curriculum, I ended up with a woman that said, hey, I want to do what it is you're doing. So she's one of those who's all the way on the other side of the state who's actually following my curriculum right now. Um, and she had written me a note that I'm, I'm trying to find. I can't find it right now, but. Uh, it essentially said the impact that you have had on my classroom already is inexplainable. That's so that, powerful. Such a powerful testimony. And it makes me feel good about the learners who are in her classroom. Mm-hmm. That they're yeah. getting what it is they need. Um, they're actually learning something. <laughs> they're, well, they're learning. I mean, I guess we can always say we're always learning something, but now they're actually they're experiencing things and learning things that they can take to the next step and that they're not going to forget next week. You know, I mean, why, why do we need to know the hypotenuse of a, of a triangle? Why do we need to know Pythagorean theorem? Why do we need to know quadratic functions? If I'm not going to be an engineer or whatever, a mathematician, why? Yeah. Preach. I do have a question. Um, so, <laughs> so are you familiar with the NC IDEA program that ARC is funding? Absolutely. Uh, I, I'm, I'm familiar with NC IDEA. I'm familiar with that program. Uh, my board and I actually took a look at that and we weren't quite ready to apply for it because again, we didn't have a tangible right. something or other to apply for. Our grant will be applied to yeah, I just love that. I mean, we're talking about, we always talk about at EntreEd how entrepreneurship is this pipeline. And if we don't start infusing it down at K-12 level, we're going to have students that don't even think about entrepreneurship when they move forward. And it's so interesting to me that a lot of states are pushing more towards workforce, going through entrepreneurship training and people that are in existing industries. And so it's interesting that um, as that grows, like workforce entrepreneurial training and industry training and entrepreneurship, that we're not at the sam- simultaneously pushing it into K-12. It's, it's an uphill battle more in K-12 where it's top down and the other industry. So I just always like to think about that because I know North Carolina has a lot of programs. I know our friends over at um, ELI Mindset are doing training statewide mm-hmm. in North Carolina for industry. That's the so. uh, Entrepreneurship Learning Initiative? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm familiar with them. And uh, as a matter of fact, NC IDEA, we're actually looking at a grant specifically from them, not the RAC one. That RAC one's pretty big. And, yeah, yeah. And But the yeah. with regards to kind of like top-down versus bottom-up, uh, when you come into my E2 class, you will have gone through, in E1, you will have gone through, written your own business plan. You would have worked with industry mentors. You would have prevented, not pre- presented, your pitch to a panel of industry experts. You would have gone through a pitch competition. When they come into E2, they have these skills. They have this ability to think and problem solve and make decisions and make recommendations. So we have them go and engage a company and help them and to act as a consultant to help them solve marketing problems that they're having. And these, we've, I have probably three or four instances in the last four years where these folks have been hired into positions that are normally reserved for college interns. And the high school students are in there doing it. Wow. And what happens there then is I have actually got people calling me up now going, hey, do you happen to have a senior who can help me with this? So the, the top down versus the bottom up, I think the more that you just put the kids out there. I mean, these kids are amazing. 
I mean, yeah. all we got to do is just tap into them, you know, get their nose out of the flipping textbook and let's start getting their hands dirty and they can show what they can do. Yeah. I love that. Let's just show, let's just throw them and showcase them. And then everything will just fall into play. Honestly, honestly, I'm always impressed by the students. They know more Absolutely. than me. Yeah. And, and, and <laughs> let, you know, and let them manage their own obstacles and manage their own setbacks. And how do they, how do they develop their own resiliency? I mean, if we're constantly there spoon feeding them, you know, I'm never going to let them fall off the rails altogether. You know, and I'm, and I will tell them and say, I'm not sure about that decision. You, you go right ahead, but you better be ready to make a U-turn. And I've had kids that have made multiple U-turns in the, the development of their business plans. And yet they come back and they say, I never would have learned as much as I did had it not been managing that setback. Absolutely. And I always, I like that because we always ask as our final question before we ask about how to contact you is how do we get, like, what are some small p- tangible pieces of advice for educators in this space? And I think one that you just already said was to let your students shine and to really put a, the majority and the bulk of the expectations on what they want to do. Um, okay. So do you have, I mean, do you have any other like tangible pieces yeah, of advice? I, I, boy, I sure do. And that's, that's one <laughs> is to, if, if we are going to ask for our students to stretch, challenge themselves and leave the comfort zone, we have to do the same themselves, ourselves, and we have to model it for them. And I would highly recommend trying something new, standing up in front of your students and saying, this is something new. I've never tried this before. Help me learn. And so you're saying, hey, I'm with you on this. It's new to us. So one, one advice is stretch yourself in order to get your students to stretch. A uh, second piece of advice is to present Present, present. Have your students constantly up in front of the class delivering some kind. It could be a recitation of a poem. It could be reading a letter. It can be putting together a PowerPoint and presenting it to the class. Get them up as much as you can doing the things that they're going to need to do later. The third thing I would recommend doing is if your students aren't more tired than you, when class is over, something's <laughs> wrong. Make them, I came in today and I literally spent five minutes with the class. And this is in an 87 minute class. I spent the first five minutes with them, told them, you know, the drill, you know what it is you got to do, get it done. I'll be back here in 30 minutes. I went into the, sat at my desk. They sat here and there was a beehive and they just got to work. And I said, okay, your, your 30, 40 minutes are up now present. And they were up in front of the class presenting you know so and I didn't do anything did I so no. they're more, t- they're, they're <laughs> five, more tired than me. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent I wrote that down that's excellent advice if the students are more aren't more tired than you at the end of <laughs> your day you've done something wrong because that's I mean that's the thing that the teachers have this thing about about micromanaging all of it and you you can't. You got to get get the heck out of their way. Let well, them I mean, do their you, thing. you do, but but also remember that there are there are teachers who have their students doing a lot, but what they're doing really isn't meaningful. You know, if they're sitting in front of a computer screen, reading a computer generated textbook, and filling out a computer generated study guide, and then taking a computerized test just so that they can do it again tomorrow, they're not going to be tired. They're not going to be excited. They're not going to look look forward to coming to class, and the. You know, you, neither one of you will be tired. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's really me, make things meaningfully tired <laughs> mm-hmm. so that they're not just reciting and doing simple, basic things that you can just give them. Yeah, I think that's really important advice. Well, this has been I mean, there's been so many insightful pieces in this that I just have a lot to unpack. And Toy, I know exactly who you're talking about with the parallels. So, Dan, we will connect you to Steve Rice. He is our Arkansas um, entrepreneurial educator. I just think that you guys have a lot of be really good connection. I would love, love the connection. Yeah. yeah, I will connect you after this because uh, we try to do that with all of our guests. There's a lot of parallels and complementary work. And I think it's great if we can just continue building this ecosystem and grow this this kind of connection in this okay. case. So, yeah. Well, we will do that. And so our final question is how can people connect with you if they want to learn more information about what you're doing, more information on ASAP? 
How can the, they do that? Okay, then the, the easiest way is probably through Twitter, which is mind on ASAP with the word separated by the underscores. On my Twitter profile is my uh, Weebly website, which they can go to. And then also, if they were to go to Apex Friendship High School staff directory and then click on my website there, that's my school website. And they can then get all the letters out to my parents. I send a letter out to parents probably biweekly telling it this is what happened in class. This is what's going so that they can then kind of see themselves what's happening if they wish to. In the cool. Class. I wish teachers would do that for my kids. That'd be so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny you say that, Toy, because I have parents coming to me and just saying thank you, thank you for the communication. And you know, parents are part. Parents are one of our primary stakeholders, and so I'm constantly inviting parents into my classroom to witness presentations and be innovation coaches. And I mean, I love we them, it. I we want them as partners. It. They're 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 partners, not opponents. And well, that's not always the case, as you know. That's awesome. That 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 just. It would be so nice because, you know, I have boys. So when I ask what happens, what'd you do today? Nothing. <laughs> you learn anything? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, here's, here's a word of advice to you, to parents out there too. And that is the idea. Uh, I never asked my kid how was school. I have a ninth grader here at Apex Friendship. I graduated my oldest son from here three years. He's now at South Carolina. My mother, my mother, Freudian slip, my wife and my um, alma mater. And I never ask them, how was school? I'll say, what did you learn today in school that was interesting? <laughs> and they've got an I've asked a similar question, but I still get, I don't know. Well, we just got to force it out. We'll take their phone until they answer. Well, they're, they're still little, so they don't have a phone yet. <laughs> okay. How old are they? Nine and seven. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that is a, okay. Well, they should be, they should have something exciting happening in school. I know. Well, yeah, well, it's not, we get into this every podcast. It's not a very exciting school. I'm, I'm working on it. Okay. But <laughs> all right, let me know issues. how I can help. <laughs> Perfect. I need to well, take yeah, all we'll of definitely. our awesome friends and just get a big bus, Amber, and just like pile all these people onto a bus and just storm my kid's school. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, honestly. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's get like a big Partridge family entrepreneurship bus and go on tour. <laughs> I read this book on questioning. It's called The More, a More Beautiful Question. And I, so now, because I have a younger brother that's a junior in high school, and I'm trying to actively get him to be a little bit more engaged in this kind of space, entrepreneurially minded, rather than just thinking he needs to take AP and all these other courses. So I just always ask him, did he ask any like good questions today? And no. I do not accept yes or no like questions that. as answers. So that's something what's you the, could ask too. What's the book called? More readable questions? Um, it's, it's a more beautiful question. More beautiful question. That's cool. Yeah. And it has all these different question formulation techniques. So I always like to ask, his name's Josh. I ask him that because there's like research on as they grow through K-12, but they also ask less and less questions. So I've tried to challenge him to ask more insightful questions mm -hmm. as they, as he grows. So yeah, I text him every day. I said, did you yeah. ask a good question today? <laughs> well, we could talk to you all day and we'll probably have a lot more. I want to have a follow-up podcast interview over the next couple of months, maybe to see how you're progressing through the growth of your nonprofit, because I'm really fascinated in it in that well, process. So thank you. We're excited about this. So thank you so much for joining the podcast. We're really excited. I'm really excited also. And I appreciate you allowing for my voice and my students voice to be heard. And I'll look forward to doing it again, perhaps. Yep. It was wonderful, Absolutely. wonderful having you and meeting you, Dan. This has been great. Virtually, virtually. <laughs> virtually meeting, virtual meeting, but still counts. Yep. Absolutely. Toy. Great meeting you too. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you.